So I'd like to go ahead and get started. I think probably everybody who's here knows Dr. Patty Amadio. She's been with us for a few years on a part-time basis, still a very significant part-time basis. She's uh, <clears throat> the course director for the Doctoring Two course. And uh, this uh, past year, the Dean appointed her as a College of Medicine grievance officer. So when students submit complaints to the <clears throat> anonymous complaint box, she's the one that receives them. Or if people uh, want to make uh, complaints or express concerns uh, 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 in person, she's the one to whom they uh, go. So she's been gaining more experience in understanding the kind of issues that are going on with students. And I'd ask her to spend some time talking with us about the learning environment, which she's going to do today. Uh, there is CME available for participation in this session. If you want CME, you need to put your name and email in the chat box. The chat box, if you rub your, run your cursor over the screen, is located in that bar at the bottom near the center that says chat. And so if you just click on that and put your uh, <clears throat> name and email address in there, then you will be subsequently emailed an evaluation so that you can get CME credit for uh, this event. So Dr. Amadio, take it away. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Oh, all right, so we're gonna talk today about the learning environment and um, I'm gonna sort of blow through these disclosure and you can read the objectives. I wanted to get right to the why. So like, um, you know, it's important concept of andragogy that adult learners want to know why like they don't really engage with something that they're supposed to learn unless they feel like it's meaningful to them and stuff so um you know why are we talking about this um and like why in particular was i willing to when dr olive asked me besides that you know he doesn't ask me to do that much so i would do it you know like that um that I'd be willing to spend the time to learn this and why was I willing to be the grievance officer? So um, the answers to those questions are because I am sort of a casualty of a bad learning environment. And um, the bad learning environment that I was in in my uh, residency years has really affected kind of every moment of my career as a physician subsequently and of my personal life as well and really has changed uh, how I do things, how I operate since that time. Um, you might say, and it would be true, I think, that a, a bad learning environment almost killed me. So that's why this is important to me. And um, I really care about this a lot, and I really think it matters. And um, so I'm going to tell you what I plan to do, which is first we're going to talk about some important definitions pertaining to the learning environment. Um, uh, then we're going to review some data that kind of validates my hypothesis based on my lived experience that the learning environment does matter to what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is make empathetic and knowledgeable doctors that can take care of us all, right, when we retire and all. So um, after that, we're going to kind of take the temperature of the Quillen learning environment in a in two ways, in a narrative way and in a statistical way. And, and lastly, we're going to look at some ideas of stuff other schools have tried to do to make their learning environments better and see, you know, and along the way, we'll try to have a couple conversations as time permits. So that's kind of an audacious goal. So I'm going to kind of get moving. <coughs> so the learning environment um, is basically like the whole gestalt of what makes up a school. It includes the social interactions, which are really complicated because they include learner to learner, faculty to learner, and then all the baggage that swirls around those things like um, past ex your past experiences with learners, their past experiences with authority figures, what people else have going on as far as pressures in their lives, and all that stuff impacts the social interaction piece. What's the organizational culture of the place like? Is it very formal or informal? Um, what kind of organizational structures and hierarchies impact uh, the way the place feels? What are the physical spaces like? You know, we, we're blessed to have really beautiful physical spaces. We have all the lovely trees on the VA campus and the very nice buildings of SGH. And the students have that plush center that they have never been in back there. Um, and even the virtual spaces, like what we're doing now on Zoom and what the D2L sites and our, our websites and stuff that the students use are like. All those things kind of surround and shape 
uh, the learner's experiences and they affect their perception. And because, you know, all of cognition and learning is really grounded in sort of emotional tone, they really affect the acquisition of knowledge as well. Um, in a more general sense, it's like the atmosphere, you know. Um, what's, what do we reward? Um, what do we model? You know, what's, what's the ambiance of our school? What's the personality and the spirit? Th those kinds of words get at what is the learning environment. Um, the learning environment includes the curriculum, which we're all, we've all been thinking a lot about the formal curriculum and how, how it's organized. But it also includes that famous hidden curriculum that I'm sure you all are aware of, that set of sort of moral, ethical, value-based method messages that are conveyed to students kind of under the radar. You know, what happens in the hallway rather than at the bedside or in the lecture uh, hall. Um, and, and sometimes, Unfortunately, these hidden curriculum messages are in opposition to what we're saying we want to be em emphasizing and valuing and um, promoting. Um, it turns out that um, these hidden curriculum things really impact student burnout, moral injury, and, and cause their empathy to deteriorate. And we're gonna uh, detail what are meant by those terms here shortly. Um, oftentimes, the historical culture of medicine is such that mistreatment and harassment have been part of the learning environment. You know, um, I think we all have a sense of what mistreatment is and, you know, kind of the just tr treating people poorly. Um, harassment is being, you know, injurious, being offensive, um, humiliating uh, people, verbal abuse, sometimes physical shoving and that sort of thing. Um, bullying, undermining people, intimidating people, that sort of, uh, and, and worse, you know, worse things that we're aware of, like, you know, sexual harassment, that kind of thing, creating a hostile environment based on um, uh, saying unkind things about different minority groups or whatever. And so these also impact the neg negatively the learning environment. And we're gonna, there's gonna be a later faculty development talk about these topics. So, um, you know, so the question is, in general, across the board, how do medical schools do with learning environment? Are we good at this you know, as a whole or not? And, um, you know, it, it turns out that if you measure medical students against their age-ranked peers at the time when they enter medical school, um, they're actually way better than their peers in terms of levels of depression and rates of burnout. They're significantly better. But somehow, by the time they leave medical school, they're way worse. So um, at, by the time they leave, half of medical school medical students are, are burned out, and more than half, almost 60%, are depressed. So that somehow they came in as these like bright, happy, altruistic people, and now something that happened along the way um, turn them into these people that are doing way worse than their age peers. So, so that kind of suggests that there might be a problem. So what is this burnout stuff that we keep talking about, right? Um, it's kind of a, a syndrome. You know, it's a, a, a grouping of constellation of symptoms like emotional exhaustion, being really cynical, um, feeling kind of de depersonalized and disengaged, detached, bad self-esteem feeling like you just really haven't accomplished anything. Um, I could say it's sort of like just being from the Northeast, but in general, but <laughs> anyway, um, you know, um, but what's its impact? You know, why do we care about burnout? What bad things happen as a result of people being burned out? It turns out that there's a higher risk of depression, um, which of course causes poor functioning and other comorbidities. Doctors that are burned out commit twice as, make twice as many medical errors. They're 25% more likely to become, to abuse or become dependent on alcohol. They have twice as much chance of being, having suicidal ideation. They have a lot more car accidents and almost having car accidents. So it's, you know, kind of like burnout could kill you. You know, a lot of people don't really like this term burnout because it sort of sounds like, you know, somebody from the 60s that, um, 
kind of, you know, did too many drugs or something like that. Um, and, and people talk about, and you know, it is kind of a really pejorative term to sort of picture these burned out cynical doctors. But so people also like to talk about moral injury. I'm done. One second. The concept of moral injury um, was originally uh, described in military people that had, you know, seen sort of unspeakable things and had to do things to survive and to, to, to as part of their job in the military that were, you know, against what they believed, you know, what they should be doing in normal life. So, um, so this idea of moral injury has a lot of overlap with the description of um, burnout. Um, it's emotional exhaustion and, cyn and cynicism that arises from witnessing violence and injury, you know, the aftermath of it. You know, like picture if you were um, in the ER in Orlando after that pulse shooting or something. Having inadequate resources to meet patient suffering, like like you're in Italy and you have to decide who gets the ventilator, you know, the 40-year-old or the 60-year-old. Um, uh, seeing people providing care um, that's unethical, like maybe you have a pretty strong suspicion that the person just did the bronchoscopy so that they could pay, make their boat payment, you know, rather than that it was medically indicated. Or people just being really cynical about other human beings that are coming to them for care. And then that all combined with this sense of powerlessness, like that you were sort of morally culpable because you had to witness and participate in this thing that just wasn't right. That's what moral injury is. Um, so kind of like you're made to be part of something that really goes against your belief system. Um, there's a gap between what happened and what ought to have happened. And, and the consequences of this are very similar to the consequences of burnout. Like there's that a sense of shame and guilt, and you're kind of condemning yourself, feeling like you betrayed yourself, um, maybe the values of people that raised you, the, the other human beings involved. Um, it results in anxiety and depression, self-destructive behaviors. You know, this degree of pain, people want to anesthetize, right? It ends up with substance abuse disorders or people just deciding to kill themselves. It's basically, you know, I'm basically talking about, you know, a PTSD type picture. So moral injury is part of this whole spectrum of what happens to uh, our trainees that make them turn into those people that are not doing quite as well as their peers by the end of school. So um, seems like that the, the parts of the learning environment we ought to study, uh, to focus on, as we're talking today, are the ones that affect these, that, that cause these things we're talking about, such as you know, burnout, um, which is correlated with the rest of the list, depression, anxiety, suicidality, um, affects the quality of patient care, it makes people leave the profession altogether, um, results in them acting unprofessionally, increases medical errors, results in you know, physicians having problems with their relationships, and um, increases their substance abuse, and um, then, uh, and contributes to like a deterioration in empathy uh, during the process. So, um, so that brings us to kind of like, what is empathy? So um, a, a, a really good description of empathy um, for, med for the terms of, for the purposes of medical education, I think, describes it as more of a, a cognitive mindset than as a sort of fluffy feeling. Um, it's, it's the ability to cognitively understand the patient's feelings and concerns and their perspective, and then to be able to communicate that you understand that to the patient so that they feel kind of heard and seen. And, and then with that, also communicating um, that you're intending to be a helper. You're intending to be someone who's there to promote healing and to have a therapeutic presence in their life in whatever way you can and alleviate suffering with whatever tools are at your hand. That's empathy. And it's probably worth contrasting it with sympathy, which is more of an af the affective feeling of um, kind of feeling things. It's almost like you're feeling, you're identifying so much with the other person's feelings rather than just perceiving them that you're really feeling them yourself. Um, this is something I kind of have had problems with in my career. Um, 
sympathy more leads to burnout. If you're feeling empathetic, it tends to lead to professional satisfaction. Um, when you're really feeling the other person's feelings, um, it can kind of obscure the right goals. Like you almost are more trying to alleviate this mental suffering and anguish that you're feeling on the patient's behalf um, more so than necessarily do the wisest, wisest thing. Like you might not make the right choice under the influence of sympathy, but empathy doesn't really impair your judgment in that way. It allows you to still be objective um, uh, and, and, it, and it, it preserves your health. It preserves kind of the boundary. It enables you to kind of keep these altruistic goals. Um, so let me go back in a, for one minute. We, you know, as we talked about this empathy, I bet what you're picturing is kind of like um, a doctor modeling that with their patient and the student going, now that's empathy right there. You know, like uh, I remember seeing my dad lean up on the bed with one of his patients and take him by the hand and, and say, Mr. Mr. So-and-so like, don't give up, don't give up. You know, I really care about you and stuff. And, and like, you know, that was really powerful to be, but, but this is also talking about um, uh, the empathy that we, um, show towards students and each other. Some of this modeling is not just physician to patient, but it's also modeling empathy towards students and how we also interact with each other. Um, that, you know, there's kind of like, I mean, I think we might say that some students are more, are easier to show empathy for than others. There's sort of like a, a stereotype of a, really easy to easy to be empathetic towards student like somebody that's always that's always prepared and prompt and professional and hardworking and they really care and they're enthusiastic and they're smiling and um, every now and then you know they they you know they're trying to shovel out their next door neighbor's car and they're five minutes late for a lab well it's easy to be empathetic to that student but there might be other students that we have trouble being empathetic towards for various reasons so um, I just want to throw it out to you guys for a minute so you can like unmute your mics if you want to respond. But um, what, uh, have reflect on that for a minute, like think back to a student that maybe you got a little irritated with or you had trouble being empathetic towards and sort of let's talk for a couple minutes about what might block your ability to show empathy to students, like what might be some challenges there. Just talk about that for a minute or two. Anybody has any thoughts, they can just throw them out there. Okay, well, I will. Um, I would say it is more difficult to be empathetic to a student or anyone else that repeatedly does not show empathy for other people. Hmm. That's, that's, um, that's very true. Uh, the, the other thing I've encountered is when somebody gave me the feeling that they were using their misfortunes to try to manipulate me to do things that they wanted me to do. <laughs> that would definitely be a challenge. I think another difficulty can be when you just don't have all the information and don't know the whole story. Uh, certain behaviors that seem unreasonable might seem a lot more reasonable understood in the light of other things going on in the student's life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, this is uh, Varun Kumar. Sorry, um, my, my video is not on right now. But um, on, on what Dr. Olive said, I think that's an important point. And, and uh, I don't know, I found, I, I've done a lot of reading on empathy. Um, I think it's, it's more important than we give it credit for in, uh, in uh, all medical fields. Um, I think uh, one way to strengthen empathy has been talked about is, is assume that someone's actions that rub you the wrong way assume they have more information to the story uh, that may may lead you to be more 
empathetic um, and, and, and maybe make that the default assumption uh, when, when, we, when someone does give us a challenge uh, to be empathetic with them. Uh, this was uh, this was this was more in in related to patients. Um, I'm, I'm a clinician, but I'm, I'm I'm sure with students as well, it could help. I think that's really a wonderful suggestion. There's this. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, also, what's what's your opinion uh, as to whether empathy is related to cultural competence or understanding the others? I think that. Um, that empathy is highly related to that because sometimes this notion of sort of a stereotypical like the, the student that's easy to be empathetic towards that's a culturally informed construct that the student that's not presenting those typical behaviors that we respond well to may be coming out of a culture that those behaviors weren't part of um, yeah. for whatever reason is and that what you're getting at, Antonio? Related to that, uh, it's also the uh, unconscious bias. When right. You are as essentially assuming that this person has this problem because without mm -hmm. even consulting or something. Right. That gets to this idea of this idea of this thing called the ladder of inference. So um, we observe a behavior, a statement, whatever. And then we make inferences about the reason for that behavior or that statement. And, but our inferences may not be right. And the only way to really know is to test your inferences and to ask what was going on, you know, in a non-judgmental way. And, and I'm not sure who the person was that made that really wonderful comment about making this basic assumption about learners that, that there is going to be a better excuse than you thought. In other words, um, kind of assuming the best of them that they are well intentioned, that they are trying to do a good job, and uh, that they're there, they're here to learn. They want to learn. That matters to them. Assuming that as a baseline, and then sort of backing yourself up and saying, um, uh, you know, asking, you know, what was going on with that? What was happening for you at the time? Those kinds of non-judgmental questions can help get at finding out what doctor all have said were so important, which is what is the real reason? What is really going on? And creating a trusting environment where you might find out what that is and be able to help with it. I think that's one of the things that I find a lot. Um, I jokingly say it, it's hard to hug a cactus and that there's sometimes that, you know, it's the students who are where it, it doesn't come easy, where there's a lot of things that we can make those presumptions about. In some ways it's about, and what I try to help people realize, because I deal with a lot of these students, is that the very things that are making them seem almost undeserving of mm -hmm. our empathy and sympathy are the things that are actually the, the, the things that often are the symptoms that we're talking about of depression, anxiety, all the things that are not obvious make them not easy to care for sometimes, but those are the ones in turn who actually need it the most. Wow, thank you, Jean. That's really powerful. Hi, hi. This is Jerry. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey, Jerry. So a question I have is, to what extent do power relationships, hierarchical power relationships end up getting in the way sometimes of empathetic interactions between people. I mean, is that something, uh, have you seen anything in the literature about those kinds of issues, uh, Patty? Um, I, ha I haven't seen anything, but I feel sure that that must be powerful. Can you give me a, more of an idea of what you're, what you're picturing or what you're getting at there? Well, so in, in the teacher-student relationship, you know, classically, traditionally, there is this uh, thing that goes on where there is sort of this power relationship between, oftentimes, between the student and the teacher. And um, I guess what I was asking is, does that sometimes get in, get in the way of kind of understanding and, and being empathetic of each other because of, of this, this power dynamic? I definitely think so. Um. So I would add, Jerry, that I don't know any literature about that, but just observationally, I see that being the case. There's things that students don't want me to know just because of the capacity that I'm in. 
that may be highly relevant to their behaviors and what's going on, but they will think that, you know, I will think badly of them if I know this or that about them. Um, and likewise with course directors, they may not tell course directors the factors that are going on that are impacting their performance because they don't want to appear weak or vulnerable. Well, that's very true. Hmm. Well, um, this has been a really valuable discussion. I'm going to keep going because I have a lot of ground to cover, but thank you guys for all those really wonderful thoughts. So it turns out that um, empathy tends to decline during medical school and that the results, there's measurable results of the empathy decline in the kind of physician that the person turns out to be. Um, it turns out that physicians that aren't very empathetic, their patients aren't as satisfied, not surprising. They don't communicate as well with their patients. Their patients, interestingly, don't adhere to therapy as well. They themselves are less, have less job satisfaction as a physician. They tend to get sued more. Um, and they're more burned out, which then leads to all that other bad stuff that we were talking about, like depression, suicidality, murder, accidents, leaving the profession, and substance abuse. So um, I'm going to ask you to throw out another question or two. So if you were kind of going to think about medical students across the country as a, as a whole, you know, just kind of the whole broad picture of medical students in the United States, and what kinds of things do you think they might identify as important in the learning environment that affects their ability to learn. So since, since the preclinical and the clinical years are kind of very different in character and there might be different things, let's break it up. So considering that question for the clinical environment, what kinds of things do you think medical students would say um, affect their learning and the the quality of the learning environment for the clin the preclinical years. Any thoughts on that? Just kind of shout stuff out. Uh, this is Jerry. I would say one thing might be um, ill-defined expectations. Yeah, that's, that's, go ahead. Anything else? Anybody else have stuff? Uh, well, another one might be sort of uh, overload. Um, not just ill-defined expectations, but a perception on the part of the student that the expectations are too high. Makes sense. Definitely. Any other thoughts? Oops. Probably communication. If people know what feel like they know what's going on versus not know what's going on, if are they being informed of their expectations? And also, I think another one is for them to feel like they have some type of a voice or representation. Makes sense. All right. Um, this is Jerry again. I mean, I think another thing has to do with um, purpose. I mean, to feel that the things that they're learning are relevant, uh, relate to what they're, they're trying to ultimately become. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it turns out people study this stuff, you know, go figure. That's what I found out this last couple months as I was reading all this. <laughs> and um, uh, so there's this study that um, looked at across five different medical schools as a multi-center trial. And what they did was they did these learning environment scales where they measure how the students perceive the learning environment at that particular institution. And then they compared them with the students' burnout scales, like how burned out were they after the clinical years. And then they also repeated it in the clinical years, this particular study. So it turns out you hit on, you know, a lot of the stuff that was significantly correlated. So in one sense, it was just the general gestalt overall learning environment wasn't very satisfactory. That correlated with how burned out the students became. Um, they really value support from us. We value that. That's, that matters. They like being in a collaborative environment where they feel like they're part of a team and they feel like, you know, the stereotype of like the medical school student gunner, you know, really hyper 
competitive and out, you know, out to get you, stab you in the back. They don't like that. So a collaborative environment is positively correlated with less burnout. Um, so, um, and the idea, again, that the faculty cares about their education. And there, there was another study um, that focused on the preclinical years. And this, rather than looking at the endpoint of whether students were more or less burned out according to those burnout measures that they do in these studies, um, this one actually looked at their performance on step one, you know, which typically is like the culmination of the preclinical years, um, that uh, these are items that if they had positive ratings on these items of the learning environment, they actually did better on step one, which makes a lot of sense. Because if students are overwhelmed and they're in this sort of fear-based mentality, if you take a fear-based person and you look at like a functional MRI of their brain, like the parts of the brain that are lit up are not the parts where synapses happen. Like where you want the brain to be lit up is in like the prefrontal cortex where they're making all these associations and figuring out how things go together. But where it's lit up is all in their like limbic system and their like fright and flight stuff lit up, you know? So it makes sense that, that it might matter that they might actually learn better if they're in a more, you know, holistic environment that supports them better that they're not just in a state of fear and exhaustion. So it turns out what Jerry said, this idea of this meaningful learning environment uh, was important in this study, that the curriculum was preparing them for something to be a good doctor and the basic sciences were really clearly clinically related. The idea of this healthy emotional climate, you know, having a sense of achievement um, versus the idea that students were all going, I hate this, I'm gonna quit, you know. And, and the idea again of the students being supportive one to another, that positive ratings in these three areas were associated with people doing seven points better on step one. It's kind of interesting. Um, how about the clinical environment? What do you, what do you guys think in a clinical environment as far as like on rotations and stuff is, is kind of different. Uh, what, what kinds of things do you think matter in terms of uh, two students in terms of what the clinical environment on their rotations is like? Hi, Patty. It's Ivy. Oh, hi, Ivy. Um, Maybe that they feel like a part of the clinical team, that they're included in the, the clinical team, not just shadowing? Yeah. Other thoughts? Um, this is Varun Kumar again. I'll, I'll go back to the empathy. I think a, a clinical environment where um, it's clear the team has empathy for the patients uh, uh, from the students seems to be, uh, that's a positive thing. Yeah. I think consistent expectations are important. <clears throat> I hear students talk about at times, this attending or resident told me to do it this way and I did it that way. And this other person uh, fussed at me for overstepping my bounds. Yeah, that would be frustrating. Also, also, in addition to the expectation, not only from the attendings, but for the other group, like, because, uh, you know, they're going to be a multi-level team where they're going to have, like, residents, fellows with them. And it's good how the other um, people on the team, they are realize uh, the role of the students and they make the students feel it and show it so they can, again, feel important and part of the team on the clinical rotation. Excellent observation. So in that, oh, go ahead. I hear somebody saying something. Yeah, it's Jerry again. Hey, um, I guess this probably didn't come up in any studies, but, you know, I think with what we see with happening with COVID-19, you know, to some extent, some people taking care of these patients, I think, are experiencing burnout in part because some of the people, many of the people they take care of uh, don't get well. So I think in a clinical environment, to be able to see that your efforts or your team's efforts are leading to uh, patients um, prospering, getting, getting better is an, an important thing. I, I sort of doubt that this comes up in this literature because most of the time we have uh, our students in environments where patients are recovering fine. But I do think that that's an important part of of burnout and may apply more to certain circumstances and specialties than others. Yes. Yeah. So
so that same study I talked about first that compared the learning environment with the medical student burnout, um, that one looked at the clinical years and what they determined was very similar to what you're saying. First, the general overall, like what does this feel like overall as a whole being, if they're dissatisfied with the learning environment that tended to promote burnout. What Dr. Olive said, the disorganized rotations are correlate with um, feeling more out of sorts. Um, again, it matters how we interact with the students. They really care about how their faculty interacts with them. Being inadequately supervised clinically makes people more stressed out and burned out. Encountering cynical people, often residents and interns, because they're experiencing this work overload that they probably are burned out, so it's kind of a cyclic thing. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, okay, so those kinds of things. It, it, and it turns out that sort of the critical time when the, the, the most major impact on the student's development of burnout increasing and their level of empathy decreasing happens is in that the year where they're transitioning from the preclinical to the clinical years. It, in me, U.S. medical schools, there's a well-documented decline in empathy that happens during that time. And we, we talked about how that's interrelated with, um, with burnout and uh, other markers of poor function. This is worse for men than women. They, their empathy declines more. Um, they actually start out lower, though. I mean, it's data, I'm just saying. But um, <laughs> the people that, I don't know if this is a chicken egg thing, but people in tech div driven specialties have a more marked decline in empathy than people in, that go into patient driven specialties. But interestingly, it doesn't seem to be something that has to happen in medical education because in Japan and South Korea, um, this doesn't happen. So, um, uh, if you ask what factors influenced these, the students in why they became less empathetic, um, they say things like um, that the discovery, one thing we didn't bring up in our comments is the idea of medicine as a business, that it's, it's all about, you know, get them in, get them out, or um, having to do the numbers, like the business end of medicine. Um, Again, encountering these negative attitudes and cynicism in their faculty and residents, um, maybe like saying, referring to patients by like derogative, derogatory terms and stuff. Um, just the overall fatigue, experiencing the time pressures and encountering patients that, that make it hard for them to be empathetic, that, that they feel like maybe they feel like the patient isn't trying as hard as they are, that kind of thing. So those are the things that, um, that are associated with this deep drop off in empathy by the end of the third year. Oh, oh, okay. So now I'm gonna tell you a little story. So this is, I, I, I might, I'm kind of a long storyteller. I hope this isn't too long, but um, this is a true story that happened here at Quillen. I haven't been here that long. So it's during the time I've watched this person go through the whole process of their education. Uh, during the time, the short time that I've been teaching here at Quillen. And I have permission from this person to tell this story. And I sort of learned about this story piecemeal just through my ongoing relationship with the student. So this student, um, you, a lot of you may know that me and uh, Paul Monaco uh, co-facilitate a, um, a case-oriented or case-based learning group. And um, we really enjoy that. And this the year this student started, we had just a particularly wonderful group in that class. They were like really funny and um, really engaged and a really smart group. And we just had great conversations and laughed a lot and so on. And this particular student was part of that cohort. Um, she was just had a really, really sharp mind. And um, she had a very dry sense of humor, which I appreciated very much. And she was a real well-rounded person like she had been an opera singer and a professional athlete, and um, she was just really pretty mature. She was a little older than most of the matriculating students and had just a real good sense of herself and um, was kind of comfortable in her own skin. She was a really enjoyable person to be around. I, I just kind of stayed up with her, you know, as she went on through the curriculum. She was like sort of drop into vent here and there and stuff like that. 
So as she went on through the clinical, the preclinical curriculum, she was just you know, killing it. Like she was just a really great student. She scored in the 260s on step one. Um, so she, as, she, as she goes into her um, rotation, she's really well positioned to be whatever she wants to be, go into any field she wants to. So um, everything's going along fine, you know, through the first half of her M3 year. Uh, she's decided, she starts thinking she's going to go into like a surgical subspecialty. And then on this, um, ah, thank in, you. In, in the spring of her M3 year, um, she go, goes on this rotation, one of the required clerkships, and um, the head resident at the beginning of the rotation says, uh, what are you, you know, what fields do you guys want to go into as, and, and, you know, nobody's going into that particular field. And the resident says, you know, okay, but, you know, I think this is relevant for you and stuff. And, and of course, she was a really responsible student. So she was going to be, you know, she was the kind of person she's going to show up early. She's going to do her work. She's going to study hard. And because um, and she, she knows that it, she's going to have patients that have problems related to this specialty. And she just wants to know for her general knowledge, you know, she's going to be tested on it and stuff. So she, she was doing her, th her job. Um, you know, she was on a, a hospital service for this rotation and um, she was supposed to make rounds on patients. So she was coming in, making, spending a couple hours making rounds on her patients. And one day she had been in, in already for a couple hours. Then she came into the, wherever she was going to work on writing her notes, went to sit down. And this resident started yelling at her and said, you know, why are you late every day? What do you think, you know, who do you think you are coming waltzing in at this time? And um, uh, you just think you're better than us because you're going into this surgical subspecialty and everything. Like, what are you too good for us? And you're just going to come in when it's, and she's like, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been here for two hours. Like I haven't been late on any day. I've gotten here before you every day. And well, this resident uh, got their back up and wrote her up. They sent a report to the clerkship director and she had to go in and see the clerkship director and she explained what happened. Nonetheless, she did not get as good evaluations on the clerkship and didn't perform as well in the clerkship as was her usual habit. That was kind of discouraging. Then she went in the next rotation and the next rotation, it was more of a, you know, a clinical type rotation. So on, on the next rotation, when she was on the hospital service, she had this really sweet patient. This patient was like a lady in her late sixties. that was like a grandma. And she's one of those like really loving, kind patients that so easy to take care of. Like they're always, you know, happy and grateful for everything you do type of thing. So she's really liked this patient personally. And, um, and the patient had uh, like heart failure and stuff. So they, they ended up you know, getting her tuned up. She was sort of had heart failure and was developing kidney failure as well. So they, um, they, they ended up sending her home um, on like high doses of Lasix to try to keep her kidneys working at the level of function that they were, which wasn't so good. And, and they sent her home. And it just so happened that at, at when she came into the outpatient side of this rotation, um, that my, my student friend was on the outpatient side. So the team's like, oh, you know her really well. You go ahead in and see her and come out and tell us about her. Well, when she went in to see the poor lady, the lady couldn't, couldn't um, make complete sentences. She was so short of breath. She gained like 15 pounds in the few days since she'd been discharged. And when she examined her, she had like rowels all the way up her back and she had four plus edema of her legs. You know, so she was in fluid heart failure. And um, the student was really concerned that her kidney function had gotten even worse. And, and she looked worse than when she had, when she had been admitted the first time, like at the beginning of the hospital stay. So the student went back to the team and said, you know, I'm afraid she's, we, I think we need to readmit her, like get check electrolytes right away. I'm afraid her kidney function's worse. So the team went in to see her and um, they, you know, talked to the lady and, talk, you know, examined her and they said, yeah, you know, we think your kidneys are going bad and you're probably going to end up on dialysis. And, and this lady was you know, so sweet and grateful for everything. She was like, you know, what's my life expectancy going to be on dialysis? Well, you know, your life expectancy is about five years. And she's like, that's great. I have five years to spend with my grandchildren. That's like so wonderful. And then, um, uh, so, um, then, but the team didn't decide to admit her. They decided to give her a dose of IV Lasix in the clinic and then see her out back the next day and try not to admit her that, you know, try to keep her out of the hospital. So they gave her this dose of IV Lasix. They didn't get any labs and they sent her home. So the next morning when my student friend goes into the clinic, she finds out that the night before 
that lady came in um, in cardiac arrest in an ambulance and um, and that she was not able to be resuscitated and she had in fact passed away. And, and she was just, you know, horrified. And um, the team kind of like, nobody really talked about it. Like nobody, they didn't really debrief it. They didn't talk about, you know, the decisions that led to it or anything. They didn't talk about the emotional piece. None of that happened. And, um, and they just kind of moved on from there. So um, after that, that experience really profoundly affected my friend. Um, she, she started thinking that maybe she didn't want to go into that surgical subspecialty after all. Maybe she should, maybe she should go into something that didn't have as much like life and death stuff in it. Instead of graduation being like a happy time, it was really kind of depressing. And, um, and, uh, it really affected her sort of self-esteem and her sense of identity, like who she, who she thought she was, you know, this kind of sense of failure that she had. And, um, you know, later she ended up, she ended up and went ahead and did apply back to the original surgical subspecialty and she did match at a very prestigious institution. But if you were to talk to this person now, you, I can hardly recognize her as the same person that I met in her first year. Like, um, she's really depressed. She's really cynical. Um, she's really discouraged. Uh, she has a lot of self doubt. She looks like, seems like kind of exhausted. Um, she told me recently that uh, if, if she could go back and talk to herself before she went to, decided to go to medical school, she would say, don't do it, don't go to medical school. So that's my little story about the learning environment here. So I wanna ask you a couple questions about that because I think that story really illustrates a lot of the stuff we've just been talking about. So thinking back to that first rotation she had, the one where she got written up, what do, what do you, how would you guys characterize what happened to her there? It was unjust. That's true, <laughs> yeah. And she was powerless. I mean, in, in that situation, it gets back to what Jerry was talking about in terms of the dynamics of the hierarchy and who has power and control and whose voice matters. And, you know, she was left feeling like even it being honest did not change anything. Um, mm -hmm. What would you call what happened to her there? You're going to label it as something. Well, I think unjust was a good label. Yeah, um, that's definitely. Yeah. Um, I was going to say it wasn't fair, but yeah. you know, that's, that's what a student would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also, it, it might not have been the turning point, but it was the start of a turning point. Right. Yeah. Would you call it mistreatment or harassment? Like, I would say it's mistreatment for sure. She it was might. the the consequence and the response, the way she was treated, was not justified to her behavior. It was it was uh, directed at her. I don't know with malice, but it, it was mistreatment in my estimation. It, it might be grievable. And so, you know, with a good grievance process yeah. in, pla in place, it, you might have a way to try to have some redress. And, and, and the redress could potentially be, in optimally could be a process that helps to repair people's perceptions of the learning environment. It certainly could. I mean, it, it, those things happen, but it could have been addressed differently, couldn't it? I agree. Yeah, I, I think I would definitely call it mistreatment. How about the second thing with the, 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 the elderly, the sweet lady? Um, what would you call that? What happened there?
I, I think it's uh, an indication of some of the values in the culture of medicine that um, we aren't, all, especially for trainees, but uh, just in general, that um, recognizing and validating the emotional context for the practice of medicine or learning medicine um, is, is something we may fall short in. And if it had been debriefed, if someone, especially knowing she had a special relationship with this patient, if she had had a, a mentoring relationship with a preceptor where that could have been talked about uh, and sorted through, I think it would have made a big difference. I do too. I think there's data to support that it would have made a difference, yeah. So unsupportive. Yeah. I think it yeah. Go ahead. It, it, uh, she was definitely didn't receive support. And when you said they didn't debrief after that, after your description, like I was heartbroken for her. And um, it may have been the first time that she, in, you know, really had a patient that um, she'd been directly involved with who had died. And that's a huge moment. And it's something that should have at least a moment taken just to check in with how she was doing. If, and, um, and even just yeah. uh, from a learning standpoint on the medical side, like, yeah, be like plus Delta, you know, saying what went wrong? What could we do better? What, 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 what we learned from this, even yeah. on, on a medical level besides on an emotional level. I mean, I'm, I think I might call that a moral injury. Yes. You guys think that fits that uh, description? Because what I was going to add to that is that it seems, it's like, what message does that say from the, the learning environment, which is, it's like this, this event happened and to have it not even be acknowledged. I mean, stepping back from the forest for the trees, uh, a patient was lost. Right. Where's the acknowledgement of that and for, like you said, then the debriefing for her personally, but professionally as a team for that. Yeah. That, it right. just, what does that say about the learning environment? Because it's kind of like, next. Right. Moving on, you know, there's nothing to see here with her. But, and, and then, you know, what impact has this had on her? Like you could sort of see all the different stuff we've just been talking about playing out. Um, you know, so that's my story. It's kind of a sad story. So um, let's get into a, um, that was just sort of a, you know, an anecdotal story. Um, I'm going to fly through these as quick as I can. Um, like we have data on the clone learning environment. Every time we do that uh, graduation questionnaire, it has a whole bunch of these learning scales that pertain to the learning environment. So we're just going to zip through these. Overall, we're not doing too bad. We're graded for like for the, the graduating class, looking back at their M1 and M2 years, they graded the, the learning environment 4.43 out of five, 4.25 out of five. So A minus B plus, that's pretty good. Um, uh, this MSLES is this um, research tool, the medical student learning environment scale that's used to kind of pick at these uh, types of ideas. Um, we're, we're, it's a, we're doing kind of at the national average on how the faculty in, in interaction is. Um, there were some comments that were a little, uh, maybe a little con reflecting some problems, tense communication, room for faculty training and professionalism that was mentioned in the 2019 survey. Um, we're about the national average on student student in interaction, you know, so maybe like a B minus, you know, type of score there, but that's kind of, par for the course, apparently, for medical schools. On the emotional climate, to the extent that the experience ends up making you feel like you've achieved and valued yourself, we're about at the net, at or a little below the national average. There's some problem areas that show up where there's a bigger discrepancy uh, on the negative side for us, that this fact, this issue of um, people modeling using professional language and avoiding derogatory language seems to be a problem more than I think any of us would really expect. Um, they, there were problems with resolving conflicts in a way that this respect the dignity of those involved, 
being respectful of each other, like physicians and health staff being respectful, respecting diversity. I mean, that maybe isn't a surprise considering that we live in a very undiverse area. Um, showing respectful interaction at, with students and showing empathy and compassion, uh, I guess, to patients and students. So um, that gets at that whole piece of modeling empathy by being empathetic and respectful to our learners, taking that basic assumption that, uh, that our friend uh, mentioned about assuming that there's a good explanation and it, that it, they're in good faith. Um, this, these burnout scales, um, we're a little, maybe a little worse than the national average on the disengagement piece um, and the exhaustion piece in the preclinical years. The, that was all preclinical stuff, sorry. In the clinical years, we're doing well on the observation things, like even the areas that traditionally there isn't as much supervision going on, um, uh, that like the surgical fields, there's generally less. We're better than the national average on how much supervision. And you can see there's really good numbers on people getting watched at taking a history or doing their physical exam or different things. Um, uh, the emotional climate scale, we're just a little bit above the national average on um, in the clinical years. The student faculty interaction at or above the national average. And we're doing really great on this hidden curriculum thing. Like it looks like we're good 20 percentage points better than the national average on not having a discrepancy between what is being said to be being valued and what is portrayed in informally as being valued. So we're not doing too badly on that. Um, our students are about at the national average on how disengaged and burned out they are in the clinical years. Um, one area where we're, again, doing poorly is um, on this respecting diversity thing. Um, very often, and always we respect diversity on a national average 81% of the time. Uh, at Quillen, it's more like two thirds of the time. Um, apparently we're a little less good at fostering people's development as a person compared to foster we're very good at making people feel like they're they're you're being nurtured in their development as a physician so what are some future directions we could take what are some things we could do that might help us um, uh, improve the learning environment um, with regard to preserving empathy the people at Robert Wood Johnson did a, an M3 piece of their curriculum where one, there was one hour per rotation of dedicated time to talk about empathy. And they, they specifically told the students, we're doing this to help you remain humanistic and empathetic. And um, they, it was clerkship specific. It, they debriefed emotionally intense things that might have happened to the students. Um, they used blogging and had them read journal articles that were reflective. Um, they talked about positive and negative role models and the impact of morally distressing events and their experiences, how they felt insecure, what happened with mistakes. And it, they proved that that drop off in empathy that happens during the, the third year did not occur in the group that went through this intervention. So that seemed to work. It might be a really great thing we could put in as our doc, part of Doctoring 3. Um, we might keep doing faculty development stuff like what we're doing give people educational tools to use when they're when they are starting to go up the ladder of inference and uh, not be empathetic towards a student um, things they could do instead of being harassing or intimidating to try to make an, a point uh, perhaps um, uh, simulation and debriefing training might help a good bit in how to address these things when they occur um, different techniques like this advocacy inquiry method is a good way to give feedback without getting people to feel defensive. You might get training in that. Um, uh, uh, having us do those empathy scales and see where we are with empathy. Um, trying to do some training in ethical issues. You can find, you know, these studies and how to do this uh, in these different, you know, the outline sort of how they did it in these different papers. Um, and to put these into the learning environment. Um, things that work that help the learning environment, the pass-fail grading system, so check, you know, we've done that. Um, it turns out that mindfulness and mind-body training programs are really helpful in the learning environment. I've started to kind of like incorporate this in my things I do, like um, 
in debriefs, for example, after simulation lab, like people are kind of keyed up after they come out of the, the simulation lab and have them kind of like just take a deep, deep cleansing breath, kind of shake it off before they start, you know, start talking about it. Learning communities have a measurable improved impact on the learning environment. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and then, you know, different curricular structural changes. I think getting a more coherent curriculum like we're working towards in general um, can help and weaving in those clinical contact hours, of course, unless there's a pandemic, um, can help more with that as well. Another idea is that if there's a student from an un underrepresented group, maybe an at-risk student, to have some sort of pre-before school starts enrichment experience to kind of get them tuned up for the demands of school. This learning environment thing, learning communities thing, a learning community is an intentionally developed subgrouping of the medical school class that moves forward longitudinally through time and that is trying to create a more supportive and co collegial environment. So some people call them houses like in Hogwarts or societies or cells and they'll give them names like maybe names of a certain position or something or colors or a regionally significant subject like we could have like the moonshine house or something I don't know for <laughs> for Quillen but um so uh it about at the time this study was done in 2014 I couldn't find anything more I couldn't find any more recent statistics uh 44 percent of U.S. medical schools had learning communities in place and of the people who didn't have them uh, almost two-thirds of those were planning to, or considering putting them in. And they use them, they're used for different things in the curriculum, sometimes as a vehicle for mentoring and advising, sometimes all the clinical pieces like the doctoring course is part of the learning community, IPE. Um, sometimes it's purely social, like a, a pure extracurricular activity kind of support. Um, so, so all those things can be woven into it. Um, statistically speaking, um, the, there is statistically significantly higher mean scores on the medical student learning environment survey in, of schools that have learning, learning communities. But I would admit that these numbers are not like, you know, really impressive, like 3.72 to 3.57 advantage for the M1 versus the M. I was telling Ivy, I thought it was kind of like went from meh to meh plus, you know, kind of thing. But, <laughs> but it's definitely a measurable uh, uh, impact. And there are some challenges like developing your faculty, the, the level of commitment of faculty being that available for that number of learners for that period of time, um, funding, you know, um, keeping the students engaged, the whole, all the logistics of the curriculum and how you move people through, um, like, you know, the cog wheels of getting them through their different experiences in these groups, maintaining the groups, space to do it, all that stuff can be challenging with this learning community. Um, some schools have done a hidden curriculum workshop that they used um, to try to give students an, just, just a, a workshop sometime in the M3 year to help them to be more aware of the hidden curriculum that uh, had positive outcomes for that group. Valent groups, which you're probably aware of, are usually, typically they're psych-led, but they, they're a group in which you can do the debriefing of these emotionally resonant things. People can bring cases that they had that troubled them and stuff. Um, empathy builders like the aging game. That's where like the student wears, you know, like glasses that make them not be able to, or smear Vaseline on glasses and they can't see, like they have cataracts and they use earplugs and they can't hear. And then they have to negotiate like a healthcare system as an elderly patient it sort of helps with that. And the study of literature and the arts can be a really beautiful way of enhancing empathy at, um, as well as reflective writing. So um, I, we have went a little over. I wasn't sure if I had an hour or an hour and a half. But does anybody want to talk about um, the uh, future directions for Quillen? Thoughts on these learning communities and stuff? Um, uh, any comments or questions? Um, I personally would like us to, to see us explore and or de develop learning communities here. Um, a small note is that I would personally prefer that they not be called cells because that's a little bit too prison-like. <laughs> or like terrorist group-like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, terrorism does not <laughs> what we go for. <laughs> not with the cells. Okay, gotcha. 
So one question I have about the, the learning communities. I mean, we, our students have a number of interest groups that they have created and fostered. And I've been so impressed by a lot of the different things that happen within the context of the interest groups, including, um, you know, a lot of um, community service activities that they, they engage in. Um, I understand that student interest groups are certainly a different thing than the learning communities. But I guess a question I have is, do you get into some issues perhaps of competition between interest groups and and the explicitly developed learn learning communities wherever learning communities have been instituted? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but that's a really good question. No, that was, uh, I read some papers on that. The, and that's one of the downsides of the learning communities. Uh, what usually tends to happen is that some people the mentors are better, you know, we are, some people are better mentors than others. And so the, the competition or MB. Hmm. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, I think one of my daughters went to uh, Rice University, which which has uh, residential colleges. And so, you know, I have sort of this, you know, indirect experience that, you know, this is, this is understandable as a positive thing. Um, it's, I think it's, you know, the, the devil's in the details of implementing it. And I guess too, I do have a little bit of worry about whether it will take away from some other things that exist that may partly serve the function of uh, people coming together and uh, supporting each other in the learning environment that we have through their interest groups and stuff. Jerry, just to kind of counter that, I agree with you, although we have a lot of really great interest groups and that um, do a lot of work together. But I think that one thing that, that breaks down, those, those interest groups don't have as much um, involvement at the third and fourth year. They're usually first and second year students that are involved a lot in those interest groups. Um, and perhaps a learning community, just, uh, when students really need a lot, need more support from advisors and mentors and um, they don't always have someone to go to in that third and fourth year. Um, I think that Dr. Amadi has a, a description of, um, of her friend that this went through this if they had perhaps been in a had a strong mentor one way or the other um, whether through a learning community or just some sort of um, a, someone that they felt comfortable with sharing some of these details maybe some of this could have been mitigated um, so I, I, I see your point absolutely but I also wonder if there's just can we have a role for both so I think that's one of the, the benefits is the, the longitudinal nature of the learning community. I want to go into a point. I wonder if we could do something to lower the threshold uh, of reporting. Like uh, to call it a grievance, obviously that's most more serious and I, I understand that some students might not want to do it. But I don't know, I don't know what could we do to lower that threshold because many of those things were part of a chain, you know, mm -hmm. that could have been mitigated or, or sold. Yeah, I don't know if that anonymous system was up and running at that point. I don't think it was um, as she was going through all that. But um, I think that because we have such a small school, like it wouldn't be very hard to figure out who that person was, right? So um, like I, I made sure to get permission before I told the story, but, um, that's that's holds true for a lot of different kinds of these complaints where if you give almost any details at all it's pretty easy to deduce what you're talking about in, in a way that people are concerned um i mean we've all had sort of like a big example of 
how people who aren't supposed to be retaliated against can be retaliated against anyway. And so even though we like the whole idea of this grievance system is that people won't be retaliated against for coming forward and saying something that we, there's ways of retaliating that are kind of covert and that can still happen. And I don't think the students are naive about that. So there's this whole issue about even if it's anonymous reporting that if you provide enough detail to be able to do something about it, somebody's going to know because if you relate much detail about the interaction, then the person will know who it happened with in all likelihood, unless it's such an incredible pattern with the person that, you know, that, that that's just how they roll and they wouldn't necessarily remember. I have a kind of an, a uh, random inspired thought here. I actually um, coordinated a faculty mentor program when I was at Brody. It was called Personal Professional Leadership Program, and it was a combination of faculty mentoring and a social, more of the social aspects of things. And so I've got some experience with that, and there were, it's more than we have time for here. There were definitely some very wonderful things that came from it and a lot of challenges uh, in the implementing. But in trying to think of practical solutions based upon what you're talking about today, we had talked about this, I think, in the uh, diversity uh, committee about uh, something came up about the the big program that we have and it's something that's very much student run right now and there's some good things with it and some challenges that I've gotten from feedback from students but that's something where I've had a thought that that's definitely something that could be built upon that's already existing and students already buy into it but that you could add uh, make that the continuity because your big is always going to be one step ahead of you and if mm -hmm. big has been somebody who's been mentored, that's a way to kind of get that uh, positive culture, the collaborative culture built. But if you added a faculty mentorship element <coughs> in the program, it could be something that could be built upon. And for people that don't know what Dr. Daniels is talking about, uh, when she says the big program, it's like a big sibling program where new first year students are paired with a second year student and they just, they call it their big program. How about on the other side, on, on the faculty side? Uh, what do you mean? Well, did that uh, attending, or I don't, I don't know who it was, did, did, did he ever know what happened to that, that girl? Or Which student, some, like the, which story, the... the yeah, the, the letters of recommendation. The, the I don't know that that, that that person ever knew about that. Um, this, this person never made a complaint about that particular instance. I don't want to go into too much detail about that. But, but that's um, definitely some training that ha has to happen there. Yeah, it, uh, that's been addressed. Yeah. But it didn't, but not because of this particular student. So. Um, so two things that like your some of your your examples i love the idea of having like dedicated time for students to for humanism and professionalism to kind of um you to put it into the curriculum or into doctoring three that that they're going to have this hour per rotation to reflect on some of these things and it's intentional and not just happenstance um i also really you had up there something about um, sim or uh, training for uh, role play with with faculty um, and I think that that's something that we probably haven't we've explored enough is you know role play or sim with um, educational experiences for mm -hmm. with faculty with some of these challenging um, scenarios so I, I think that's oh. something that we could look into more I don't know if that's what I meant, but that's a really good idea. So we could have sim, use sim to develop faculty in terms of like having simulated difficult experiences with mentoring students and stuff. That's a great yeah. idea. That isn't what I said, but it's a good idea. Well, you, I, you <laughs> were going quick I and I, it, yeah. that's what in my, went in my brain. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so. that's awesome. So um, yeah, I think that part of the doctoring three, like my, should include a piece like that, where there's the opportunity, an intentional opportunity to debrief um, 
emotionally loaded things that happen to people and to talk about stuff like mistakes and stuff like uh, just different things that happen so that because people are more broken up like they're not with their friends and they're with this person and this person and they just lose that continuity in the third year that's another piece of what happens um, that they lose their way from their social supports as they're on their different different rotations so this would be a much a good way of calling people back in Anyway, I, sh I should probably wrap up. What do you think, Dr. Olive? Oops, I can't hear you. We've had good participation this afternoon. We had uh, more people than I might have expected for an end of day event. It looked like we had about 30 people here. And I think you've done a great job, Dr. Amadio, of introducing some important topics for us to discuss. And I think the level of engagement was good this afternoon. So thanks everybody for participating. If you want CME credit, make sure to put your name and email address in the chat box. Thank thanks you so much, everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks for all your great comments and participation. It was wonderful. I appreciate it.